Hey, good morning. Welcome to Chapter 14, Section 3. This is uh, Imperial China Collapses. We are going to kill off the Chinese Empire and uh, throw China into a nasty and prolonged civil war, then an invasion, then back to civil war, all the while going through two world wars. It's going to be fun. All right. So first, we need to talk about the different groups that were protesting and uh, unsatisfied, dissatisfied, unsatisfied, angry with the Qing dynasty and their emperor. Um, one of the groups was a group called the Nationalists. Um, they called themselves the Nationalist Policy Party of China, Nationalist Party of China, party. And they uh, called for modernization. Um, they're led by a guy named Sun Yat-sen or Sun Yixian. I don't pronounce Chinese well. Um, and the party is also known as the Kuomintang. In 1911, they actually overthrow the Qing dynasty, which had been in power since 1644. Um, the new government sets themselves up as a republic, which sounds great. And Sun takes control as the president. Uh, this party has three ruling principles that uh, nationalism, democracy, and economic security for all, which all sounds awesome. Um, the problem is uh, they're not really able to make that happen. Um, Sun is not able to get the power that he needs as the president. Um, he, he doesn't have the authority. He doesn't have the support of the military. And he's not able to unify the country. And so when the traditional power of the emperor is gone, Parts of China just break off and are under control of kind of like local warlords. Um, Sun realizes that <clears throat> he's not able to really uh, unify the country the way he wants. So he hands the presidency over to um, a guy um, who used to be a general under the old Qing Empire, hoping, you know, this guy's going to, you know, be president and sort of rule by the three ruling principles, etc. cetera. Um, that doesn't really happen. Uh, this general, whose name is Yuan Shikai, is kind of a douche. Um, he quickly betrays all the ideals of the revolution. Um, he's essentially a military dictator. Apparently, at one point, he even tries to declare himself the new emperor. So, you know, completely reversing the revolution. And um, the people freak out. And uh, there's local revolts and etc. And China sort of collapses even further. Um, moving on. Let's watch this. October 10th, 1911 was the day that marked the collapse of the Qing dynasty and led to the end of China's 2,000 years of dynastic rule. On that day, a bomb accidentally exploded, triggering a coup in the city of Wuzhang in Hubei province. China under the Qing dynasty was challenged in every front during the first decade of the 20th century. These challenges included moral disintegration, defeat by Japan, Empress Dowager's coup d'etat against the Emperor, and the Boxer Rebellion. The October 10th Wuzhang Uprising toppled the Qing dynasty, the last imperial dynasty. The coup triggered the Xinhai Revolution or 1911 Chinese Revolution and ended with the abdication of the last Qing Emperor, Puyi, on February 12, 1912. It led to the establishment of the Republic of China in 1912. One of the key players in the downfall of the Qing Dynasty during the double 10th Wuzhang Uprising was Sun Yat-sen. Sun became the first president and the founding father of the Republic of China under the Nationalist Party or KMT. As the pioneer of the Republic, Sun was regarded as the father of the nation. He co-founded the KMT and became its first leader. Another key figure was Yuan Shikai, a leading general under the ousted Qing dynasty who became the second president of the Republic of China. According to historical texts, Yuan established himself as a military dictator and later tried to declare himself as the emperor. 
However, the aspirations of the pioneer revolutionaries to replace the Qing dynasty with the Republican government never really took off. After Yuan's death in 1916 and until 1928, China remained divided as warlords fought for power. This became a period in the history of the Republic of China known as the Warlord Era. Despite this, the double 10 1911 Wuchang Uprising marks a major turning point in Chinese history. It ended China's 2,000-year tradition of dynastic rule by emperors who were regarded as the Son of Heaven in traditional Chinese culture. It also ended the Manchus' nearly 300 years domination of the Han Chinese. In 1949, nationalist forces were defeated by the communists and fled, moving the Republic of China to Taiwan, where it has remained until today. October 10th continues to be one of the most important national holidays in Taiwan. All right, so in the midst of all of this sort of battling for power and chaos, World War I breaks out. China decides, okay, under, again, the leadership of, of Sun, that they're going to enter the war on the side of the Allies. And the reason they pick that side is mostly because Germany has territories within China. Germany owns Chinese land. And so, you know, it's pretty smart. They're thinking, well, hey, if we can help this group defeat Germany perhaps they'll give us back the land that's technically ours. Um, so, you know, you know how World War I goes. Everybody sits down at the Treaty of Versailles, not the best treaty ever written, and the leaders at the treaty decide to give the German colonies to Japan instead. So that's like somebody coming into your house and saying, wow, this is an awesome backyard. I'm going to give it to your neighbor. What? Okay, on May 4th in 1919, um, that should be students, students, okay, who were watching what was going on um, became very, very angry. And, uh, and so they're angry with the treaty and they protest. Uh, many young nationalists turn against Sun and the Nationalist Party because they feel like, hey, you're not standing up for what we need. You're not fulfilling your promises and you know, you're letting the Europeans roll right over us. And some young intellectuals, you know, decide that they're going to look for another way. Maybe, maybe the Nationalist Party isn't the way to go. And they start looking at the communism that's brewing right next door in Russia. Um, this group would be called the May 4th Movement. Now, it's not officially a revolution, but these demonstrations show that the Chinese people want a new, strong, modern country, and that uh, the Nationalist Party is just not moving quickly enough, and they're not strong enough to do what the people want. So in steps the Chinese Communist Party and a guy named Mao Zedong. Now, originally, he's like, um, I think, a librarian. He is not a leader in the in the party. He's an assistant librarian, I believe. Um, but he's a member of the party. And the Chinese Communist Party uh, is founded in 1921, and Mao's part of it. And they envision a, a different sort of communism than in Russia. Because remember, in Russia, uh, Lenin took the writings of Marx, which talked about the urban or city worker and the city worker who owns their labor working in the factory. It was all based on the Industrial Revolution. Well, China hadn't really had an industrial revolution. So China doesn't really have those urban city dwelling workers that um, Lenin had in Russia and that Marx had written about. What China does have is a whole lot of rural peasants, people who are still working in the fields every single day. And so uh, Mao and the Chinese Communist Party start sort of creating a communist party that is similar to but different than that of the Communist Party in Russia. When Sun dies, the Nationalist Party um, goes to a guy named Jiang Jiexi. He's the son of a middle-class merchant, and a lot of his supporters are bankers and business people and other middle-class people. And they, for obvious reasons, are afraid of communism. If you own a shop, you're not going to listen to somebody who says, I think 
there should be no private ownership. We all own your shop now. Okay, so that's, that's you know, going to be one of the core issues between the two parties. Now, Jiang promises democracy, uh, but his government becomes more and more corrupt. He's just not able to keep control over it. And for the Chinese peasant, okay, the Communist Party is looking more and more attractive. You have one party over here that's promising you democracy, but not really able to deliver. And, you know, people are, are ripping off the government and getting rich. And then you have this other group that's telling you that you, the Chinese peasant, are the backbone of China. You are what's best about China. That doesn't suck. So Mao rises to power in this conflict between the communists and nationalists. To secure the support of the peasantry, as the communist forces win battles and land that they take from the nationalists, they redistribute it among the people. So this makes them super extra popular. Uh, Jiang takes drastic action against the communists, and he sends troops into cities, rounding up all the local communists and, and union members or anybody who has sort of expressed sympathy for the Communist Party and literally just massacres them all. <clears throat> this nearly wipes out the Communist Party in China. In 1928, Jiang declares himself president of the Nationalist Republic of China. Now, the United States gives them recognition because we look and we're like, woo, republics, we love republics. But the USSR, okay, which, you know, under, under um, Lenin and eventually Stalin, would not because of that very same slaughter that just happened um, to the Chinese Communist Party. Civil war. Okay, by 1930, the country is still fighting a pretty gnarly civil war. Mao is recruiting peasants, and he's teaching them to fight a guerrilla war. They don't have sort of all the resources that the nationalists do, and the nationalists are getting some support from the United States. Um, so guerrilla war is uh, guerrilla warfare is you know sneak up, hit them, maybe steal some of their guns, and book it out of there. It's not meet on the battlefield. We're going to fight out a big uh, big old battle, and we're going to you know see who wins. It's sneak attacks run, sneak attack, run, sneak attack, run, until you eventually sort of wipe out your enemy because they're, they just, they're exhausted and they can't figure out where you're coming from. Um, it's what worked in Vietnam. In 1933, the nationalists are able to completely surround the communist forces, um, and the communist forces are seriously outnumbered. Um, they have about 100,000 men and women, and I think the nationalists have something close to 800,000 or, or something like that. It's, yeah, definitely crazy. Um, so they essentially sneak out. It is a retreat. Um, in China, it's painted as this mythical, glorious, you know, um, event, but it really is a retreat. They're, they're running away so that they can live. Um, what's crazy about it is how far they, they took off. Six thousand miles okay i can barely do a 5k and they walked six thousand miles thousands are going to die um in the snow of the cold of wounds and just starvation illness it's it's brutal uh the survivors reach an isolated part of china where they're pretty much safe and they regroup uh they actually sort of live in these caves that are dug into these hills and um, and try to regroup. But when they get there, there's only 7,000 of them left. Now, of course, this becomes the very famous Long March. And when they, they get to where they're going um, and they regroup and more and more people start joining or coming there and joining them, this is when Mao really takes over as the leader of the Communist Party. Now, check this out. This is the map of where they go. And if you can see right here, they start, if you look at this map, um, I believe it's in French, but that doesn't matter. You can figure it out. The yellow is the communist bases. Okay. The pink is the nationalists. So things are not looking good here. And the orange line are Mao's forces. And they book it out of these areas. Okay. Make it through this nationalist held territory, swing around go around all these mountains and end up way up here. Okay, that is a long ass walk. So 
the communists are down, but they are not out. Now, nearby, watching the chaos going down in China, is their neighbor Japan. Now, after World War I, Japan has grown strong, and they've modernized much like the you know, Western powers. And much like the Western powers, they wanted to take part in this imperialism that they see going on. They wanted land. They wanted territories. I mean, you know, just like Britain, when you're an island, you need more raw materials than you can probably produce. And China's civil war seemed like a great opportunity to just go in there and take over. Oh, look, my neighbor's a hot mess. I'm going to go take their stuff. So in 1937, Japan invades China. The nationalists and the communists stop fighting each other, sort of make a shaky truce, and join together to fight off Japan. See, now this is why China is crazy awesome, and this is why China is probably going to be the world leader in the next, you know, 50, 60 years. The fact that they can go from fighting a civil war to stopping their civil war to being like, hey, we're not going to fight right now. We're going to band together. We're going to fight that guy. And when we've defeated that guy, I'm going to kick your butt. And that's essentially what they do. Um, it takes a while to fight off Japan because Japan is, is industrialized, militaristic, and wickedly organized. Um, their attack on China is brutal, okay? Um, they bombed cities. They bombed fields. They're causing widespread starvation. They're slaughtering millions. Um, and they couple this. Eventually, they're going to team up with Germany. Um, all you need to do is Google the rape of Nanking. Um, and that's all you, you know, any image from that is all you need to know about how awful it was. Um, but they, they couple this invasion with the idea of racial superiority. So they're not just looking to take over the Chinese. They feel that the Chinese are less human than they are. Um, a sad facet of World War II. So we are going to... Um, pause our civil war, fight off the Japanese, okay? And in the midst of all this, World War II is going to break out. But I want to go back to China. I want you to watch this and answer the questions that follow. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course World History. And today we're going to return, sadly, for the last time on Crash Course to China. By the way, Stan brought cupcakes. That's good. I wish I could draw some parallel between this and China, but I got nothing. They're just delicious. I'll sure miss you, piece of felt Danica cut out in the shape of China using blue because we felt like red would be cliche. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, Mr. Green! You don't get to talk until you shave the mustache, me from the past. So the 20th century was pretty big for China because it saw not one, but two revolutions. China's 1911 revolution might be a bigger deal from a world historical perspective than the more famous communist revolution of 1949, but you wouldn't know it because one, China's communism became a really big deal during the Cold War, and two, Mao Zedong, the father of communism, Communist China was really good at self-promotion. Like, you know his famous book of sayings? Pretty much everyone in China just had to own it. And I mean, had to. So as you no doubt recall from past episodes of Crash Course, China lost the Opium Wars in the 19th century, resulting in European domination, spheres of influence, etc., all of which was deeply embarrassing to the Qing dynasty and led to calls for reform. One strand of reform that called for China to adopt European military technology and education systems was called self-strengthening, and it probably would have been a great idea considering how well that worked for Japan. But it never happened in China. Well, at least not until recently. Instead, China experienced the disastrous anti-Western Boxer Rebellion of 1900, which helped spur some young liberals including one named Sun Yat-sen, to plot the overthrow of the dynasty. Oh, it's already time for the open letter. An open letter to Sun Yat-sen. Oh, but first let's see what's in the secret compartment today. Oh, more champagne poppers. Stan, at this point aren't we sort of belaboring the fact that China invented fireworks? Wow, that is innovation at work right there. We used to not be able to fire off one of these. Now we can fire off six at a time if you count the two secret ones from behind me. Dear Sun Yat-sen, you were amazing. I mean, the Republic of China calls you the father of the nation. The People's Republic of China calls you the forerunner of the democratic revolution. You're the only thing they can agree on. You lived in China, Japan, the United States. You converted to Christianity. You were a doctor. You were the godfather of an important science fiction writer. But the infuriating thing is that you never actually got much of a chance 
chance to rule China, and you would have been great at it. I mean, your three principles of the people, nationalism, democracy, and the people's livelihood, are three really great principles. I mean, the problem, aside from you not living long enough, is that you just didn't have a face for Warhol portraits. <sighs> It's too bad. Best wishes, John Green. So the 1911 revolution that led to the end of the Qing dynasty started when a bomb accidentally exploded, at which point the revolutionaries were like, we're probably gonna be outed, so we should just start the uprising now. The uprising probably would have been quelled like many had before, except this time the army joined the rebellion because they wanted to become more modern. The Qing emperor abdicated and the rebels chose a general, Yuan Shikai, as leader, while Sun Yat-sen was declared president of a provisional republic on January 1st, 1912. A new government was created with a senate and a lower house and it was supposed to write a new constitution. And after the first election, Sun Yat-sen's party, the Guomindong, were the largest, but they weren't the majority. So Sun Yat-sen deferred to Yuan, which turned out to be a huge mistake because he then outlawed the Guomindong party and ruled as dictator. But then when Yuan Shikai died in 1916, China's first non-dynastic government in over 3,000 years completely fell apart. Localism reasserted itself with large-scale landlords, with small-scale armies ruling all the parts of China that weren't controlled by foreigners. You might remember this phenomenon from earlier in Chinese history first during the Warring States period, and then again for 300 years between the end of the Han and the rise of the Shui. So the period in Chinese history between 1912 and 1949 is sometimes called the Chinese Republic, although that gives the government a bit too much credit. The leading group trying to reform China into a nation state was the Guomindong, but after 1920, the Chinese Communist Party was also in the mix. And for the Guomindong to regain power from those big landlords and reunify China, they needed some help from the CCP. Now if an alliance between communists and nationalists seems like a match made in hell, well, yes, it was. That said, the two did manage to patch things up for a while in the early 1920s, you know, for the sake of the kids. But then Sun Yat-sen died in 1925, and the alliance fell apart in 1927 when Guomindong leader Chiang Kai-shek got mad at the communists for trying to foment socialist revolution, to which the communists were like, but that's what we do, man, we're communists. Anyway, this turned out to be a bad breakup for a bunch of reasons, but mainly because it started a civil war between the communists and the nationalists. We're not gonna get into exhausting detail about the civil war, but spoiler alert, the communists won. There are a few things to point out. First, even though Mao emerged victorious, he and the communists were almost wiped out in 1934, except that they made a miraculous and harrowing escape, trekking from southern China to the mountains in the north in what has become famously known as the Long March, a great example of historians missing an opportunity since it could easily have been called the Long Ass March as it featured donkeys. Second, for much of the time the Guomindong was trying to crush the CCP, significant portions of China were being occupied and or invaded by Japan. Thirdly, the communists were just better at fighting the Japanese than the nationalists were, in spite of the fact that Chiang Kai-shek had extensive support from the U.S. And each time the nationalists failed against the Japanese, their prestige among their fellow Chinese diminished. And it wasn't helped by nationalist corruption or the collection of onerous taxes from peasants or stories about nationalist troops putting on civilian clothing and abandoning the city of Nanking during its awful destruction by the Japanese army in 1937. Meanwhile, the communists were winning over the peasants in their northwestern enclave by making sure that troops didn't pillage local land and giving peasants a greater say in local government. Now that isn't to say that everything was rosy under Mao's communist leadership, even at its earliest stages. By the way, that is an actual chalk illustration. Very impressed. In a preview of things to come, in 1942, Mao initiated a rectification program, which basically meant students and intellectuals were sent down into the countryside to give them a taste of what real China was like in an effort to re-educate them. We try to be politically neutral here on Crash Course, but we are always opposed to intellectuals doing hard labor. But anyway, within four years of the end of World War II, the communists routed Chiang Kai-shek's army and sent them off to Taiwan. And these military victories paved the way for Mao to declare the People's Republic of China on October 1st, 1949. So once in power, Mao and the PRC were faced with the task of creating a new socialist state. And Mao declared early on that the working class in China would be the leaders of a people's democratic dictatorship. Oh, democratic dictatorships, you're the best. It's all the best parts of democracy and all the best parts of dictatorship. You get to vote, but there's only one choice. It takes all the pesky thinking out of it. The PRC promised equal rights for women, rent reduction, land redistribution, new heavy industry, and lots of freedoms. Including freedoms of thought, speech, publication, assembly, association, correspondence, person, domicile, moving from one place to another, religious belief, and the freedom to hold processions or 
demonstrations. Yeah, no. Even putting aside the PRC's failure to protect any of these rights, Mao's China wasn't much fun if you were a landlord or even if you were a peasant who'd done well. Land redistribution and reform meant destroying the power of landlords, often violently. But centralizing power and checking individual ambition proved difficult for the government, and it was made harder by China's involvement in the Korean War, which helped spur the first mass campaign of Mao's democratic dictatorship. Designed to encourage support for the war, the campaign was called the Resist America and Aid Korea campaign, and it resulted in almost all foreigners leaving China. A second campaign against counter-revolutionaries was much worse. People suspected of sympathizing with the Guomindang or anyone insufficiently communist was subject to humiliation and violence. Between October 1950 and August 1951, 28,332 people accused of being spies or counter-revolutionaries were executed in Guangdong City alone. A third mass campaign, the Three Anti Campaign, was aimed at reforming the Communist Party itself. And the final mass campaign, the Five Anti Campaign, was an assault on all bourgeois capitalism, which effectively killed private industry in China. Very few of the victims of this last campaign actually died, but capitalism was weakened and state control bolstered. Okay, let's go to the thought bubble. Mao and the CCP set out to turn China into an industrial powerhouse by following the Soviet model. We haven't really talked about this, but under the Soviet system, Russia was able to accomplish massive industrialization, not to mention tens of millions of deaths from starvation, through centralized planning and collectivization of agriculture following what were known as five-year plans. The Chinese adopted the model of the five-year plans beginning in 1953, and the first one worked, at least as far as industrialization was concerned. In fact, the plan worked even better than expected, with industry increasing 121% more than projected. In order for this to work, though, the peasants had to grow lots of grain and sell it at extremely low prices. This kept inflation in check, and saving was encouraged by the fact that the five-year plan didn't have many consumer goods, so there was nothing to buy. For urban workers, living standards improved, and China's population grew to 640. Million. So far, Mao's plan seemed to be working, but there was no way that China could keep up that growth, especially without some backsliding into capitalism. So Mao came up with a terrible idea called the Great Leap Forward. Mao essentially decided that the nation could be psyched up into more industrial productivity. Among many other bad ideas, he famously ordered that individuals build small steel furnaces in their backyard to increase steel production. This was not a good idea. First off, it didn't actually increase steel production much. Secondly, it turns out that people making steel in their backyard who know nothing about making steel, make bad steel. But the worst idea was to pay for heavy machinery from the USSR with exported grain. This meant that there was less for peasants to eat, and as a result, between 1959 and 1962, 20 million people died, probably half of whom were under the age of 10. Jeez, thought bubble, that was sad. And then in happier news came the Cultural Revolution. Just kidding, it sucked. By the middle of the 60s, Mao was afraid that China's revolution was running out of steam, and he didn't want China to end up just a bureaucratized police state like, you know, most of the Soviet bloc. And the Cultural Revolution was an attempt to capture the glory days of the revolution and fire up the masses. And what better way to do that than to empower the kids? Frustrated students who were unable to find decent, fulfilling jobs jumped at the chance to denounce their teachers, employers, and sometimes even their parents, and to tear down tradition, which often meant demolishing buildings and art. The ranks of these Red Guards swelled, and anyone representing the so-called Four Olds, old culture, old habits, old ideas, and old customs, was subject to humiliation and violence. Intellectuals were again sent to the countryside, as they were in 1942. Millions were persecuted, and countless historical and religious artifacts were destroyed. But the real aim of the Cultural Revolution was to consolidate Mao's revolution. And while his image still looms large, it's hard to say say that China these days is a socialist state. Many would argue that Mao's revolution was extremely short-lived, and that the real change in China happened in 1911. That's when the Chinese Republic ended 3,000 years of dynastic history and forever broke the cyclical pattern the Chinese had used to understand their past. I mean, at least in some senses, those nationalist revolutionaries literally put an end to history. That sense of living in a truly new world has made many great and terrible things possible for China. But the legacy of China's two revolutions is mixed at best. China, for instance, made most of the camera we're using to film this video. And China made most of the computers we use to edit it. But no one in the People's Republic of China will legally be able to watch this video because the government blocks YouTube. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Crash Course is produced and directed by... All right, please answer these viewing questions. Later.